All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. I pray as always that this message is a message that you got to have for your people. May those who are proud or secure in their sins be humbled, but the humble lifted up. In the name of Jesus, amen. What we're doing on Wednesday evenings, I've started a new sermon series based on the book by the president of our denomination. We are a denomination of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. That's what it's called. <clears throat> Matthew Harrison is our president. He was reelected to a fourth term as president of our synod, so he'll be president for the next three years. And he wrote a book, and the book's entitled Take Courage. And I encourage you to read this book. You can order this book. And it's written by Matthew Harrison. So I want to set the stage tonight by having you turn to Luke 12, 22 to 34. I want you to turn there right now, but we're not going to read this right now. But I want your Bibles open to Luke 12, 22 to 34. Luke 12, 22 to 34. We'll read it in a moment. We're not going to read it now, but I just want the Bible open, and I want you to have it open to those pages. Luke 12, 22 to 34. For many people, our current culture in America is very confusing. You know, I've brought up the fact that culture can be confusing for us, but you know, I never really took the time to define what I mean by culture. You know, that's actually a hard word to define. And I want to make it easy for us, easy to understand. So when I say culture, what I mean is simply what our society values and what our society is endeavoring to achieve. That's really the culture. For example, the culture of the Lutheran Church of our Savior, I hope, is to endeavor to satisfy the mission. What's the mission? Loving the Lord, loving our neighbors, and making disciples. Those are our three values, and everything we do is supposed to, in the culture of our congregation, our fellowship, our worship, our teaching, our togetherness is in order to satisfy those values. Loving the Lord, loving our neighbors, and making disciples. So we have a particular culture within our congregation. So America's culture is simply what, in general, is prized or valued. What they're endeavoring to achieve. When you look at the educational institutions, when you look at the philosophies, when you look at the idea makers, when you look at entertainment, when you look at who our culture is looking up to and what they represent and value, that's what I mean by the word culture. And what's happened, of course, is the culture, you can feel it in your bones, I can prove it to you, I can throw up a whole lot of things, but I know you, you people that are here, and I know a, a lot of people watching, and I don't think you disagree with me, that the culture is shifting drastically, even within our lifetimes. President Harrison has a quote that I thought was funny. One of the things that you guys do, and I know you do it because you're here, is you come to church twice a week or once a week. I know that you do this. You're here. You're, we're worshiping together, okay? That is a value that is not shared in the wider culture in America. But a few decades ago, weekly worshiping God was as regular or as normal as brushing your hair. Now, worshiping God regularly, weekly by, or even bi-weekly, is as regular as brushing your hat. And so that's what's happened. That's just one little small area. As evidence, the culture has shifted dramatically when it comes to what they value and what we endeavor. We have bizarre culture wars now. And if you are confused by it, and if you kind of just want to stay out of it, you're told silence, meaning if you're quiet about it. Have you heard the, the chant? Silence is violence. 
Silence is violence. Meaning if you don't speak up and embrace our value, we're going to assume that you're against our value. So silence is violence. The, the, the culture doesn't even let you stay away. Even being quiet is interpreted by some as a violent stance. You either have to be for what society values or you're against it. And if you're against it, you're every name in the book. All right. And that's, that's a confusing place to be. At many places of employment, you're giving training after training about subject matters in which your faith may disagree with the goal, what the training is endeavoring to implant. So you're being taught, you're being trained to endeavor to value a thing that you don't by nature because of your faith. What? Value. So you're stuck in a position, aren't you? I either have to go against my faith or my place of employment is going to look negatively upon me because of my faith. The way Bible-believing Christians often feel now is afraid. That's how Bible-believing Christians feel now. And a lot of times we act in fear, and we talked about it last week a little bit. Have you ever been proud of how you acted when you were afraid, emotionally, psychologically, or spiritually? I bet you aren't. I know I'm not. We either get angry and try and fight the way the world fights, impressing no one, or, like poor Angus, we hide our faith and pretend it's a private affair. Have you ever heard somebody say, my faith is private? Raise your hand if you've ever heard someone say, my faith is private. I want to encourage you, and this is an encouragement, if you've ever said to someone, my faith is private, I want you to know you have no faith. Imagine if one of the apostles kept their faith private. My faith is a private affair. I, I will not share it. Well, we'd all be dying and going to hell. Authentic faith is not private. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Faith in Jesus Christ is public. That's why, and I want you, this isn't even written down, but I want you to, to notice something that happens governmentally and politically. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution enshrines, do you know the very first freedom enshrined in the Constitution? Before freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You will hear politicians now say, that we in America have the freedom to worship. Don't ever let them get away with that. That is not the freedom enshrined in the United States Constitution. Freedom to worship means that we have the freedom to do what? Gather here in our building. Not, not that that's unimportant. That's not what it says. The government has zero right to prohibit the free exercise of your faith. That means you should be able to speak about your faith where? Everywhere. Everywhere. Your faith is not a private affair. It's not. Tell me one thing Jesus said in secret. Tell me one thing that the apostles were like, oh, no. Nothing. So if you ever say, well, my faith is just very private, just understand this, your faith is very dead. And you're only saying that because why? What's the reason that your faith is so private? What's the reason? Because you're afraid. That's why your faith is private, because you're afraid. You're afraid. So what people do when they're afraid is they either lash out or they keep quiet. So I want to encourage our congregation today. Dear Christian, have the courage to live out your faith truthfully and lovingly. Have the courage. That's what we need. 
the courage to live out your faith truthfully and lovingly. You and I need the courage to live authentically as Christ followers. We need the courage to follow the mission to love God, love our neighbor, and make disciples. We need the courage to do just that. We need the courage to evangelize. We need the courage. That's what we need. The courage. Do you know that liberal theologians today, that's so ridiculous. It's just so ridiculous. Liberal theologians today say that evangelizing, meaning telling people that don't believe in Jesus, to believe in Jesus, an attempt to have them drop their false gods and adopt Christ. You know, the way to salvation. Liberal theologians are now saying that evangelization is colonization and we have to decolonize. As if making them believe in Christ is colonizing them. You know what I say? I can't swear in church, but you're mm -mm, right. We're bringing them into the colony. The colony of the kingdom of God. They're filled with the devil. They're worshiping a false idol. They have no idea of the truth. And Christ commanded us, go and make disciples of all nations. You know, you know how he could have said that? Colonize them. Not violently, not to adopt our cultural values, but to adopt what? His. Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples of what? Every language, tribe, people, and tongue. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is sending people out to lovingly and truthfully tell the world about Jesus because the world is what? The world is dying. The world is dying without Jesus Christ. What's so ridiculous is another thing people will say is they'll say, well, Christianity is a Western religion. That is, again, one of the most ignorant, misguided things I've ever heard. 66 books of the Bible all written by Jews. Where do the Jews live? In the East. When you say Christianity is a Western religion, what you mean is the Easterner people colonized us. They told us about their Eastern Jesus. And we believed in their Eastern Jesus. And we changed our entire culture to get in line with Eastern Jesus. A bunch of olive-skinned Jews. Not one white man wrote one book in the Bible. And yet in our institutions of learning, Christianity is a Western religion. I don't care how many letters behind your name you got, you're still stupid. The simple fact of the matter is, spreading Jesus Christ has nothing to do with westernization. It has everything to do with saving souls. And we need the courage to live out our faith truthfully, lovingly, and honestly. So where does courage come from? How can you and I be courageous in a wicked and evil generation? Because that's what we're living in, is a wicked and evil generation. It's not new. Courage comes from certainty. Have you ever wondered? I'm not saying that everything I'm about to mention is intelligent, but everything I'm about to mention is pretty courageous. <sighs> Climbing Mount Everest. That's a thing... I'd never do. That's the thing I'd never say. Hey, Chris, do you want to climb Mount Everest? No. No, I don't. I don't even want to try to climb Mount Everest. i got to be honest with you. So these people train to do this, and they're not always successful, by the way. There's a lot of dead bodies on that mountain, seriously. But nevertheless, they, they do it, and what do they tell themselves? I got this. I'm certain. They're certain. You talk to a sports star. You ever, like a football player, I love football. The best football players, honestly, guys, they're arrogant. You know what they say? They say it all the time. I'm the best. Nobody can beat me. And you know what? They believe it. 
certainty, I mean uh, courage, the ability to dive over the middle and try and catch a ball while a 300-pound man is about to smash your face in. That comes from certainty. I'm sure what? I can do it. The kind of certainty that I was just describing, though, is prideful because you have certainty in who? In yourself. That's pride. The certainty I think, no, I shouldn't say I think, remove I think. The certainty God wants us to have is certainty in his promise and all of his promises. And we do need to make sure that our certainty is not the kind of certainty that perhaps an elite athlete has. So let me make a distinction. Let's say there are two Christians about to, they have to, I don't know why they have to, but they have to. It's of the utmost importance. They've gotten to this bridge and they have to walk across a rickety bridge for some reason. I don't know what's on the other side, but they've come to the conclusion that they must attempt to traverse this bridge, okay? The one Christian prays and says, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I know that I will make it to the other side safe. The other Christian prays, and he says, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. They walk on the bridge. The bridge collapses. They both fall to their death. Now, if you were a standby, a, a, a bystander, the first guy prayed, declared to everyone, I believe in God, therefore God is going to make me cross that bridge. Well, now, what happens inside of you about that dude's God? All right, you have doubt. He was presumptuous. But the second guy, the second guy who said, whether I live or whether I die, I'm the Lord's, so I'm going to confidently walk across the bridge, and he dies. Well, you don't have doubt. What did he say? I'm God's, whether I live or whether I die. Sometimes Christians are try, try to be certain about things that God has not promised, meaning he never promised that you'd get what? Across that bridge. That, he didn't say that. So... Let's talk about what he has promised so that we can be certain about his promises. He promises you that you're a sinner. That's his first promise. He promises you that you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The goal of a courageous Christian is not to be judgmental of the purveyors of this culture. I think that's a trap we fall a, a lot into. Judgmental means we think our, that ourselves better than. That doesn't mean that we don't make judgments. The Bible makes judgments all the time. But we're not judgmental. Judgmental means I am so much what? Better than you. It's not that. Because we are them. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we'd be right in the thick of it. So the first thing that God promises you is you are no better than anybody else. You're no worse, by the way but you're also no better. You are a sinner who has fallen short of the glory of God. So, beloved, let us stop thinking ourselves better than. But the next promise that God made is this. God promises us that he is not a sinner. And he sent his sinless son, Jesus, to die for you so that you appear before him without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is an amazing promise of God. God made him who had no sin. Who is it that has zero sin? Thought, word, or deed? Jesus. To be sin for us. When he hung on that cross, he took every disgusting, nasty, ugly, terrible thing in your life. And he put it upon himself. Have you ever been ashamed of the things that happen in your mind? Like you might know better than to say them out loud, but you've been ashamed of the first thoughts in your mind. Just a, these last couple of weeks, a couple of people called me and said things like, wow, this situation happened and I can't believe what was really going on in my head. That's absolutely happened to me. Numerous times, something will take place and a thought will come into my head and I'm like shocked at how nasty the thought is. Does that make sense? You're surprised at how ugly that thought is. Jesus took that. 
he took that, he took everything you've ever done, and he, he had it nailed on himself in the cross, and he has made, he's given you as a gift his righteous perfection. So if you trust in Jesus, God looks at you through Jesus, and what does he see? Perfection. Absolute perfection. So here's the thing. God promises you that you're a sinner, but God also promises you that you're a saint, and you're completely and totally accepted by God. What that means is you are forgiven. 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins, he is faithful. That means honest and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So do you or do you not believe in Jesus? Yes or no? Then you are cleansed of your sin. You are accepted by God, and you're going to heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. So here's the thing. Not only are you cleansed, not only are you forgiven, not only are you a saint of God through Jesus Christ, you are going to heaven. I was given the privilege today to speak to a man who very quickly, very sadly, but very quickly, <clears throat> got very ill within the past two weeks. It rushed on terribly badly, and he had brain tumors in his brain that they had to do emergency surgery to save his life. And it was very, very sad when I spoke to him. And he was crying about how scared he was. Can you imagine being well two weeks ago and then so unwell that you're slurring your words because your cranium has been ripped open because they had to take out tumors out of your brain in a two-week period of time? So frightening. And it was my privilege to say to him, Brother, even if you die, you live. You are going to heaven. You are accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 38 to 39. I am convinced, the text says, that neither life nor death, angels nor demon, height nor depth, that anything else in all creation will separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you're completely and totally accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're baptized. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Place God's name on you. Place God's name on you. So you carry the name of God through holy baptism. These are the promises. So let's go through them. You're forgiven. You are a sinner. You're forgiven. You're righteous. You're accepted. You're going to heaven. Nothing can separate you from God as long as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you carry God's name with you wherever you go. It's at this point that I'd like you to, with knowing that, I'd like us now to turn to Luke 12. See, you forgot I asked you to turn there. Luke 12, 22. What is the Christian's biggest fear, I mean, biggest problem in this culture again? Fear. So with that context that we just talked about, he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What is anxiety? Don't be afraid. That's what he says. Don't be afraid for what? For your life. What you will eat or about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food in the body, more than clothing. Consider the ravens, that they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you so anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. Basically what he says is the culture of the world makes this their endeavor. Your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. 
Fear not, little flock. My goodness, I love this text. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My goodness. Pat Lewis gave me a, a little picture with this on there. You remember that, Pat? Fear not, little flock. I love it when he calls me that because I'm that little, little sheep that can be absolutely afraid. Okay, sorry. I'm a young sheep, maybe not a little sheep. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little sheep. A lamb. I'm a lamb. Just a big lamb. All right. Fear not, big lamb. All right. For it is your father's good pleasure. What does that mean when he says it's your father's good pleasure? What does that mean? So, like we were super busy. And I kind of put it on my wife, obviously, because I'm, you know, that kind of guy. But we were super busy. And we hadn't yet gotten the gifts for Joy for her birthday. And then it hit me in my mind. And I tried to imagine a scenario where my little girl didn't have, I, not that things make it, let's put it this way. As a father at Christmas, the thing I love most about Christmas, other than, of course, Christ, I'm talking in the secular way we celebrate it, is to see my kids open their presents. Daddy Chris does not care. What if I have very simple pleasures? Feed me. All right? So I look forward to that. I look forward to eggnog. All right? I look forward to that. But if I did not have a thing to open, I don't care. Because what do I care about? I care about them. My children make it Christmas to see them run down, to see them open their gifts, to see them happy. It's a dad's good what? Pleasure. I want this. You need to begin to see yourself this way. It's his pleasure. To, to do what? To give you his whole kingdom. You're already in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world is what? Is dying. And it will die. So it's daddy's good pleasure to give you a kingdom that lasts what? Forever. Why do you think Jesus says right after this, sell your possessions, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old, with a treasure in the heaven that does not fade, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul was in prison. I want us to remember this. Where was Paul before he became a Christian, secularly speaking? He was at the height of his profession. Had plenty of money. Had plenty of stature. Had plenty of political power. He was well respected in the community. He was the guy that they were going to for answers. Then he comes to Christ. He loses his political stature. He loses his places in, in his religion. He becomes impoverished. He then gets thrown into prison. And in his epistle of joy, the epistle of Philippians... I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth. Everything I lost is what? It's nothing. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The word rubbish is an English translation. 
It really is the word dung and a slang word for that also. He says, all that is a bunch of nothing in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law. Meaning, we just talked about this. That righteousness and that perfection comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. What is his goal? What is he endeavoring? What is Paul's little cultural society? That I just want to know him. The power of his resurrection. Share in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What he had in the world, what he lost, he literally doesn't care. You want to know what the world is petrified of? People that don't care if they die. You can't threaten a man who doesn't care if he dies. You can't threaten a man who doesn't care if he dies. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That's why the Bible says perfect love casts out what? Fear. So I know that we're not there yet, but the goal is I love God so much that what? It doesn't bother me. I can't promise you that you're going to make it over your rickety bridge. What I can promise you is that if you don't, you will make it to heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. And I pray that you would make us courageous, loving, truthful, and honest, honest believers in you. Help us, Father, in your precious and holy name. Amen.